Hey guys, I have a question for you. How do you spread abundance? This year, Joe and I are spreading even more abundance by giving out insights on money, wealth strategies, and resources in our current newsletter, Creating Abundance in 52 Weeks, that we want to share with you for free. So sign up right now as you're listening to this episode on our website at www.abundantculture.co. That's .co slash newsletter, www.abundantculture.co slash newsletter. Don't let delay get in the way of your abundant year. Now, back to the episode. Welcome back to Abundant Culture Podcast. Where we dissect the mindsets and tactics of the true beast of business. People like Gary V, Grant Cardone, and Warren Buffett. All to create a blueprint to experience life more abundantly. This week, we're talking to the author of The Carrot and the Stick, Leveraging Strategic Control for Growth. And not only is he an author, but he's a professor. He has strategy consulting firm and a software company. And in this episode, we're talking about what the carrot and the stick method is, how to achieve higher profit margins, how to determine what business to start, and so much more. So get ready to listen to and learn from our good friend, Dr. William Putzitz. Hi, Bill, and thank you again for coming on to the Abundant Culture Podcast. We are super excited to have you today because what you do was so interesting to us, and we definitely had to have you on the podcast to talk more about it. But before we go into all that, we have to ask you your backstory. Like, how did you get into business? Like, why did you get into business? Well, thank you so much for having me first. I appreciate um, uh, your having me on and and our conversation this morning. Uh, I'll try not to be too long-winded with the backstory, but it is a kind of convoluted way uh, from many different different perspectives that I came to where I am now. I started actually um, in graduate school. I'm an economist by, by training. So all my degrees are in economics, my master's and PhD, both from Cornell. Uh, and, um, so I went and got an economics degree and then I actually went out and worked in the auto industry for a couple of years, lived in Flint, Michigan. Um, Flint has always been disparaged, but I really enjoyed my time there, um, in GM and a little more of GM's heydays. Um, and, uh, when I was out in uh, Michigan, I got a call back from my, uh, advisor that invited me to come back and join the faculty at Cornell in an economics related discipline for two years. And I was on the faculty at Cornell for two years. Um, when, I, when I was there, I got an offer, which was kind of my dream school that I always wanted to work for uh, or at, and that's the Yale School of Management. So I joined the faculty at Yale uh, full-time, where I still teach uh, today uh, in executive programs. But I uh, then went from Yale full-time. A good friend of mine was on the uh, faculty and chaired one of the groups, uh, a guy by the name of Tom Robertson, uh, went on to become Dean of Wharton and invited me to come out and join the faculty of London Business School. I was there for six years, um, then uh, came back uh, in large part to raise my son in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, at UNC Chapel Hill. And now I am a full-time tenured full professor at the Keenan Flagler School at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I also teach in executive programs, as I mentioned, at Yale. I do some teaching at Duke CE um, and run my own consulting business, which I've had since, 19, uh, since 1965. Now, I was, uh, not, not that long ago since... Um, since 2005, excuse me. Um, often people ask what the name is, have any association with Boston? And no, when I was at Yale, I um, happened to live in a town of Killingworth outside on the shoreline in Connecticut. And the uh, name of the road was Chestnut Hill Road. And I just thought that was a good name for the consulting firm. And now we do a lot of strategy work with companies applying anything from game theory um, to customer discovery, um, particularly do a lot of work with value chains and the strategic control points and vertically aligned incentives, the subject of the current book, um, The Carrot and the Stick. So I kind of feel what brought me here is a combination of um, the academic background in economics and business. So I'm business school faculty at Yale. Um, I taught at Yale, at Columbia, at Cornell, at London Business School, um, as well as working since 2005. Um, So what that is uh, a number of years, uh, in, in running the business, working with companies from 
Boeing to John Deere to Owens Corning to Morgan Stanley, large Ingersoll Rand, large number of um, both large and small companies. Um, in the Chicago area, I do a lot of work where you both are uh, with companies, uh, Underwriters Laboratory up in Northbrook, um, done work with um, industries in um, Globe Union just outside of Chicago, um, uh, one company in Harvey. So I do a lot of work with companies and I've written a couple books and I kind of feel what I've been able to write about in the book bring, brings together the knowledge of the academic market and the consulting work I've done with companies on the ground and getting to know those companies. And my hope is that it brings the best of both worlds. Um, I've done a lot of work in, in business strategy on an academic front. I've also done it on the ground working with companies. So as you bring all that together, um, what I believe we are able to do on our, on the, on, with Chestnut Hill Associates and what I do personally in working with companies is, is trying to bring the best of consulting, the best of business knowledge and the best of academics together to, to learn what is what are those best practices that we can help people be um, better at what they do every day, what companies can do to be better at the strategy execution on the ground. So that's a long-winded uh, way of getting to how I ended up getting to where I am now and to our conversation. That's, that's awesome. awesome. And you mentioned uh, a couple things. One thing I wanted to uh, ask you about is when it comes to like economics I feel like it's such an important field of study and I feel like it's totally underrated because I found like I wasn't interested in economics until I was a full-grown adult um, I always kind of wondered what type of I guess career paths would an economics uh, degree uh, help you with outside of of teaching for our listeners because I feel like if I ever do go back to school, I'm probably going to get an economics degree because that's really what I really love. Joe, great question. I believe it prepares you for anything. I'm biased, of course. But what it is about what economics really is, is the study of scarcity. And hmm. we can go into long-winded explanations, but bottom line, especially in the micro field, we all have scarcity, scarcity of time, scarcity of resources for a business, scarcity of, of money, uh, all those things. How do we make decisions? in the face of scarcity and almost everything we do every single day is about that so what do we do with the with the rest of the day we only have after we finish our call we have five or six hours before we need to eat dinner um, what do we do with those five or six hours there are many choices and choosing which one is the best for us is what economics is all about so in terms of career paths um, economics prepares you for for any field in business because if you understand that you understand how a company makes, whether it be a small little business trying to deal with COVID-19 or a small little business trying to decide how they get their customers or whether it be an Alphabet or an Apple deciding how to allocate their time people for a strategy across different segments of customers. Those decisions are all about the underlying decisions, the choice decisions that we make, which economics prepares us for. I mean, most people think of economics and they think of finance or going into banking. And I'd argue, I don't care what you do in business, how you market a podcast is all about, well, you, you, if you want to try and do it, you've got to decide on what are the, all the different avenues you have and how best to spend your time choosing which one of those are the best avenue. And economics prepares you for all of that. So uh, there's not the answer Joe you necessarily wanted, like here's three career paths, but I'd argue it prepares you for anything we want to do. And you know, m much like certain other um, fields will be much more narrow. The beauty about getting a degree in economics, and I don't mean a PhD, PhD tends to be more narrow. You tend to be pigeonholed into research or academ academia. I mean more along the lines of an, particularly an undergraduate degree in economics prepares you for a, a, a way, way to think. And that's really awesome. And I and I totally agree with you because when I started to really understand economics at a baser level, I realized that it it started to affect the way one that I spent money. It started to affect the way that I spent uh like time with people sometimes. Yeah. Um because I'm yeah. such a nerd that I'm thinking about what's the ROI with talking to this person? Because I don't yeah. enjoy them very much. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and it just started to affect so many different um, avenues of life. And even sometimes I feel like when you go from not understanding economics to understanding uh, economics at a base level, 
uh, it, it kind of uh, shifts your political views a little bit as well, because certain things that you didn't understand before, it's like, oh, I, I guess I can understand why he did that. And then some things that you used to be all for, it's like, well, economically, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it really started to change everything for me. And I feel like it's something that everybody should honestly understand at a base uh, base level. And like I said, it was definitely underrated. And I wish I could just have it taught to everybody at some basic level so we can all kind of be on the same page, at least when it comes to economics. I, I, I always I would say, half jokingly, half serious, that I always wish wish that we had, whenever anyone is elected to a position or running for office, one requirement is that they have to take a basic economics class before they actually get into office so they understand some of those basic decisions. Absolutely. <laughs> I agree with you. That's not a half bad idea. Yeah, it's not a bad idea either. <laughs> um, another thing I wanted to ask you about is you brought up these, uh, these terminologies that are very foreign to me. You talked about value chains. You talked about um, a couple other things. Could you kind of expand on those things that you kind of do in, in inside your, your practice? Yeah, really important. And I'd argue this may be the most fundamental and uh, fundamentally important thing that any business should understand fully. Uh, and and I, I, I'll go a little bit back to that I'm very broad in the, in the book uh, and in the way I approach what I'll call a value chain. And, and I'll explain that in, in some and, detail. Good, please. And the name of the book is just so. Yeah, the carrot and stick. Carrot and stick. Carrot and stick. And my last name is P U T S I S. And the good thing about uh, there are good there there are positives and negatives of having a very unique name like puts us. Uh, <laughs> one of them is as long as you can remember it, um, I'm really easy to find on uh, you know just Google and you'll find me the book etc. Um, but always, before I, before I answer the question directly, the the way I. Um, I, I'll tell the story is there's a guy by the name of Jay Parkinson who started a, a telehealth medicine before the current crisis and early stages of, of telehealth. And um, it's called Sherpa with two A's, Sherpa.com. And I once asked him, he's been a serial entrepreneur, very successful. And I always asked him, how did you decide in the business model? They go to employers rather than providers or payers to get their revenue. And he said, he said, um, I followed the money and I, I, I literally sketched out where the money is in medicine and health. And I asked, well, based on that, would you give any advice as an entrepreneur to budding MBAs, to budding business entrepreneurs? And he said, buy a whiteboard. It's one of the stories I tell in the book. He said, buy a whiteboard, sketch out the flow of money in a business. And that is something that's very akin or very close to what we do with the value chain. Think about, starting a business. Um, and I use in the book, I use an example of a mapping business. You can imagine it being uh, um, a store on Main Street today that the economy opens back up and we want to open up a business. What would you need to do literally step by step by step to run that business from scratch? You need to get a business plan. You need to get financing. You need to find a location. You need to actually outfit the store or the restaurant, whatever it is, for what you're doing. You need to order inventory and supplies. You need to hire people. You need to advertise. You need to put up a web page. You need to have some sort of service and support. Um, you need to have government approvals. All those steps you would need to stand up a business. Yeah. All the way down to the very end of it where you may decide you want to sell it or give it to someone else from cradle to grave. What are all those steps you need to do? And what we do when we do that process is we look for parts of that that are controlled, that are um, in short supply, that may require a unique resource or a patent or a piece of intellectual property or approval from a government resource, because we know that's the part that's gonna be really tough for the business to get a hold of, access, control, and then move forward. So the value chain concept, whether it be for uh, uh, a broad-based company like Apple, uh, a large Fortune 500 company, or whether it be a small little business that's starting up uh, as a budding entrepreneur for someone in Main Street, wherever, uh, whatever town in the country we're, we're, we're looking at, it would be literally all the steps to run the business. And the analogy back to Jay Parkinson's story earlier, what part of what we do in that is we look through where the flow of money is. 
Um, there's a great book years ago, Profit from the Core. Um, some of the ex-Bain people had done some really good work on they call the profit pools. Where are the profit pools in the business? And we take that many steps further and try and say, okay, where are all the scarce resources in that that we may extract supernormal margins? So the short answer, Joe, on the question is that the value chain, it's all those steps that we would need to put together from the very inception of the idea and research and development design all the way through end of life of the business. That's awesome. Um, so the question I wanted to ask us is, is um, what exactly is the carrot and the stick? <laughs> All right. So, so Jess, you, you, had the, 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 you asked the key question in the, in the book, and I'm going to give you the short version, and then I'll probably elaborate on both of those if it's okay. Okay. Awesome. So, so the, the stick is what I call a strategic control point. A point of strategic control is something in that value chain that I just described that's in short supply, that if one firm can control a good portion of it, they can extract super normal margins, good margins, very profitable business throughout that value chain because everyone who wants to do business in this market needs a piece of it. It mm -hmm. doesn't have to be absolute, and ideally it is, meaning it's we hold it, no one else can do business, but it can be from strong to weak. And I'll give examples as we walk through this of just that. They tend to be... They tend to have a time limit to them. There's an expiration. They don't go on forever. Um, but there's something that the stick is a point of strategic control that if a party is able to control it in that value chain, they can get super margins throughout that value chain. In some cases, even extend that to other value chains. We call that an ecosystem. Hmm. The, uh, a, a, the, the carrot in the carrot in the stick is something that I'll refer to in the book as vertically aligned incentives, a fancy term that actually comes from, so Joe, to your question earlier about economics, it comes from uh, a Nobel Prize winning economist by the name of Oliver Williamson. He coined the term asset specificity about vertically aligned incentives. All right, now in English, uh, what, a, what vertically aligned incentives in, in, the, in across this value chain is if you have, as part of that value chain, your seller into, uh, a business or you're a business selling to consumers is if everyone across that value chain, your suppliers, your customers, your employees all have the same incentive as yours, then they're aligned. If you have one party that is not aligned with you, sometimes they actually can do good harm to your business. They can stop it from succeeding. And there are many examples that I'll give in more detail. So the carrot is, is trying to find a way that everyone in that value chain has the same incentives as yours. So they are staked, they are uh, incentivized to your success. Nice. All right, now if it's okay, I'll give a little bit more in each. Yeah, go ahead, yes. go ahead, do that. I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> the best example of a point of strategic control that I always, and I, is an example I tell through every customer, and there are many, many in the book that I go through that occurred since then and occurred over, over history. But the best example I can give is the, the soft soap, soap that we all wash our hands with. And now we wash our hands a lot these days. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Soft Soap was um, actually, it was a company out of Minnesota called the Minnetonka Corporation that came up with the brand. When I grew up, there was no liquid soap. This actually happened uh, and occurred in the 1980s. Back before then, we used to wash our hands with bar soap. Um, the company came along, they had a small little niche product up in uh, the upper Midwest, probably in Chicago um, as well. It was called Crème de la Soap on Tap. Didn't exactly run off your tongue, does it? Um, <laughs> but it was a liquid soap of some success in the upper Midwest. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to go national with it. And so the question they faced it, it, as a small little company wanting to go national is even if they were able to get on the shelves of the Walmart and Safeways of the country, they would immediately be alerting their competition, the Unilevers, the Colgate Palmolives, the Procter & Gamble's of the world, that they had this new product that consumers loved. So the best they could hope is to alert the big players who would then come in, bombard the local market with advertising, would buy all kinds of shelf space, and probably push them out of the market. And they figured if they had a year window, a year where they could keep the big players out, they could eventually be successful even with the big players in because they would build enough of a brand presence, presence, shelf space, and customer loyalty that customers would, would still like this brand that they came up with the name soft soap rather than cream latest the soap on tap. So that, that the question they faced is how do I get 
a year window to keep the big players out. Hmm. And what they decided to do is they went up, and true story, they went up and bought out. Oh, by the way, so one of the things they could have done is patent liquid soap. That would have been one. Unfortunately, liquid soap was originally patented in 1903, and the patent has since long expired. So that wasn't an option. So what they decided to do is they went out and bought up the world supply of pumps. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Um, and we did the math, a colleague of mine, it wasn't all that expensive because at that point, the pump supply wasn't all that great throughout the world. And so in order for a big player to come in, they would have seen, needed to see the product on the shelves, which took time, discover it's important, go out and build a factory for pumps, and then figure a way to make the, the liquid part of it. And that whole process took about a year. A year later, the big players came in. And then after the big players came in, about a year after that, they still maintained soft soap, that is, about a 35% of the market. And they ended up selling the company for $1.7 billion to Colgate Pomalo. That's how you become a billionaire. The point of that story was they weren't in the pump business, they were in the soap business. But the pump was a part of the value chain that you needed to create in order to produce liquid soap for all of us. And so they discovered that the pump was in short supply. It was a point of strategic control. And they were able to acquire that competency and illustrates many different things about points of strategic control, i.e. the stick and the carrot and the stick. And so it illustrates, for example, that the, the stick, the point of strategic control, doesn't have to be in your market. And it has to be part of that value chain. And that's why the value chain exercise that I walked through how to do it step by step in the book, the creating that value chain exercise is so important because it sometimes will discover, help you discover things that you never even knew were in short supply. Um, we did one for Owens Corning a number of years ago and they discovered that granules, the things that are used on roofing shingles were in short, short supply. And so they went out and decided to create their own granule production so they never ran out. Uh, so that's to me an example in a little more detail of the stick. It also illustrates a point that, as I mentioned earlier, that stick is usually fleeting. It doesn't last forever. This lasted a year. But understanding it, one, gives you the ability to get into the market, get enough of a profit in that, that you can then take that money while others are fighting to get in and leverage it now to the next market opportunity. And that's the goal. All right, so that's the stick part. Um, the, the carrot part is, um, is, and I can give many examples. We have examples in the book that I use of some work I did with John Deere and the riding lawn equipment years ago, some from Anheuser-Busch from Flint, Michigan. But I think the best example to me was in the 1990s, I spent better part of a year at Procter & Gamble's world headquarters, just kind of shadowing um, executives, getting to know the business. I was fortunate enough to be there. And they were at that time just setting up what is now standard in, most, in, in just about every business, an inventory control system that used the scanning um, techniques that they were delivering for Walmart. And in the book, I go to a very detailed story about this. And in my earlier book, um, Compete Hard and Not Smarter, I went through this story again in some detail. But the, the version of this that, that I can tell succinctly is what Procter & Gamble decided to do is they went to Walmart and proposed, let's jointly invest in an inventory management system. We'll spend 50 cents in the dollars. We both have a vested interest. We're both locked in a little bit. And this inventory control system, which is commonplace today, but wasn't back then, would enable us, Procter & Gamble, to deliver just-in-time product to any of your Walmart stores. So imagine you have an inventory at your store and it goes below some threshold level so that you're almost running, going to run out of stock. We, P&G, will show up just in time to you, Walmart. You're our most important customer. And we'll show up just in time to replenish that inventory. And the benefit to you, Walmart, Procter & Gamble said, uh, the benefit to you, Walmart, was that you can reduce your inventory holding costs on Procter & Gamble products. And we're only doing this for P&G products. The benefit for you was that you'd be able to reduce your inventory holding costs on Walmart products by 60, 60 percent. Now, to provide some perspective, back then, the two most expensive, expensive parts of business for a retailer was real estate and, in some case, marketing, and then holding inventory. Now, today, no no large retailer in the world holds inventory. It's basically a consignment store. Title goes from manufacturer to you and I. When it goes across the scanner, the retailer never holds title to that stock. Back then, they held title. So um, the benefit to Walmart was reduced inventory holding costs. Procter & Gamble had a little bit more costs because they had to get to point of sale and manage this whole process. But what I tell people is think about what that did for Walmart. Think about the following. At the time, 
Walmart got a retail price from you and I. Walmart also paid a wholesale price to Procter & Gamble, and then it had its cost of doing business. The difference is Walmart's effective margins, the margin it sees on every product on the shelf. But by doing this system and lowering the inventory holding costs, Procter & Gamble now lowered Walmart's uh, inventory holding costs, thereby raising the effective margin that Walmart store on only P&G products because the cost of holding inventory for P&G products were lower. So now Walmart store better effective margins on only P&G products. So if you're Walmart, what do you want to do? You want to sell more P&G products. You want P&G products in the front aisle where everyone sees them when they walk in the door. You want the Unilever products in the back shelf where no one sees them. I'm exaggerating a little bit. But you've now taken a behemoth like Walmart and perfectly aligned their incentives with yours by setting up this jointly managed inventory control system. It's a lot of what companies should be doing but not realizing it today in Internet of Things supply chain management. IoT in supply chain should be doing exactly that. But what P&G did was align incentives for Walmart, and better yet, they didn't have to monitor Walmart's performance on this thing. Because think about it, Walmart now, well, Procter & Gamble knew that Walmart would do what's in Procter & Gamble's best interest because it was in Walmart's best interest to do what's in P&G's best interest. And that's what we mean when vertically, you have your customer aligned with yours, the incentives are perfectly aligned. In the book, I actually walk through the steps that you would need to take how would you do it in the context of the value chain and how to correct it? Um, I know a lot of people when they hear this story, they ask, yeah, but wouldn't competitors of Procter & Gamble try, be trying to do the same thing? And I actually asked this question to John Pepper, who was the CEO at the time of Pro, uh, Procter & Gamble, and I asked, aren't you worried about that? And his response was, yes, but while the competitors are trying to break in to Walmart, we're launching it, while they're spending their energy on Walmart, we're launching it at Safeway and Kroger and CVS. And it took almost a decade for the competitors to catch up across all of those retailers. And that's what we try and do with both the carrot and the stick, is first use the value chain concept to discover them, and then have them be an advantage over a prolonged period of time while we're doing and getting all those resources that we get from the profits from those businesses to get to the next market well ahead of our competition. And then, and then Joe and Jazz, I'll, I'll, the, the last one I'll, I'll, I'll throw out as, a, uh, as, a, as an illustration of why and how that can be so valuable. I was um, giving a session about two and a half, maybe three years ago um, to a company we were doing working strategy. This is actually an IoT and supply chain for a company I respect a lot, a company named Aviol based in Dallas. And the CEO, was, his name was Ed Delansky. And um, since moved on to another company, really smart guy, um, he was um, uh, one of the heads of Walmart supply chain back when this whole thing was happening. And I told him the story, not knowing he was in Walmart supply chain at the time. And he goes, that's why it was happening. Back in the day, he was being told uh, P&G products take priority. First position in the truck goes to Procter & Gamble. If there's space constraint, Procter & Gamble gets first place. And he didn't know why he was being told that back in the 1990s until we did this session. That's how powerful the carrot can be. Um, and then I'll tell you one last thing, and then I'll, I'll let you jump in with more questions. Um, one, of the chapters, ahead, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> one, one of the chapters in the book we devote to this, we I did a, this is the academic side of it, but we did a detailed study on companies in the S&P 500 um, over an eight-year period. And what we did is we looked at, and we had subject matter experts rate companies in the primary lines of business of how well they're able to find strategic control points and how well they have uh, the incentives align throughout their value chain. And then we got data on performance of those S&P 500 firms from Wharton's WRDS database on net income, earnings, share price appreciation. And what we found is companies that do well on strategic control and vertical alignment far outperform those that don't do well. Um, to give you an example, those who are high on both, or rated high on both, um, had uh, more than doubled their earnings over a, a, that eight year period while those that rated poorly on both actually had significant earnings decline over that same period. Mm -hmm. And so um, what I argue, what we argue when we work with companies and what I argue in the, the book, The Carrot and Stick, is that it's not just some, some interesting concept, but good companies do it, good companies do it well, and companies that do do it well outperform those that don't. It's material to firm performance, whether it be the S&P 500 or a company on Main Street, I would argue. This is insane. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really amazing because once you hear it, 
it's like common sense. Yeah. But yeah. before you hear it, it's like, what is this? What is a carrot and a stick? And then now that you explained it, it's almost like, man, I don't want to do business without this. Right. Like, I really don't. Like, I don't even want to, you know, it's, Wait, it's crazy. Joe, it's funny. I often say it's like, and I, and I do believe this is true, and I'm probably guilty of it as well, is we all think almost everyone in business, from a small entrepreneur to the CEO of a Fortune 10 company, believe they have the instincts to um, get it right, to outperform others, that we all believe we're really good in business, and most of us who are successful in business are. Um, but, but, but I also argue that there are a few select people um, and I'll hold up, um, you know, the founders of Apple, Sergey Brin and, and Larry Page as an example, Steve Jobs back in the day, or, you know, but, but people who really, I mean, Jeff Bezos, all, you know, all the successful people have taken businesses from nothing and built them, uh, just get it. They don't need to read my book. They just get it. The problem is the people who get it instinctively and can do it just like those people are one one thousandth of one percent of the business people out there yet about 99 percent of us think we have those same capabilities um, and so i have always found that being able to put a step process in place no matter how good you are at business is helpful because it is it's literally common sense but taking the steps to lay it out that's by the white by whiteboard, right? And the reason why Jay said by a whiteboard is because once you step back from it all and see it, and I'm a very visual person, um, but once you step back and you can see it, uh, I think that's where the beauty comes. And the other thing to follow up on the, on the question is, I believe very strongly that you can, seeing things help a lot. So we did some work. Um, your your business address, I noticed, is funny on Lincoln Highway, and um, this is a company in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, called Lincoln Industries. They do some fabricating, really, again, a really good company, family business, one that I, uh, I respect a great deal. And we did a project for them where years ago, we, were, we did a value chain exercise focusing on the carrot and the stick, but that wasn't the end of it. That was only a core business. They did some work for Harley Davidson. They fabricate the chrome that we see as they're world-class so they don't pit and the like. So when we get a Harley Davidson motorcycle, five years later, the, the chrome exhausts are still chrome exhaust without all the pitting. Um, and that's kind of what they do. But they wanted to think about how they could expand into adjacent markets. And so what they wanted to know is how the ability to control both the carrot and stick in their core business for companies like Harley would extend into other markets. So what you look for is those points that you control in your core business, which is the second half of the carrot and stick book. How do you take understanding of that one part of our business now and what are the right businesses to expand to? That point of strategic control that you may own unique competencies in may give us advantages in other areas. And that, that example, Alphabet is the classic example. Um, and and I'll, you know, I can tell you a quick story if, if, if it's helpful yeah. uh, yep. of a session that I was in in New York where Larry Page was in it, um, one of the co-founders of, of Alphabet until recently the CEO. Um, and he told a story that I think illustrates how really good people get it. Um, and the story was a, a friend of mine, Jeff Sonnenfeld, runs a, something called the CEO Summit every year, twice a year in New York. Um, this was in December, about, um, I think December 2017. And um, there was about 200 um, business leaders and CEOs, um, ranging from Ken Rudd, the former prime minister of Australia is there, Larry Page, Jim McNerney from Boeing used to go, um, major CEOs from around the world. And there are a handful of, you know, academics and strategy people like me that get to go. Um, so I'm in the room with these people. CNBC usually covers it every year. Um, but in the room was Larry Page. And it was the subject was the uh, Tax Reform Act of 2017. What do you do with the funds that you have cash abroad that you can bring back home, repatriate to the U.S.? So Jeff asked Larry Page in front of 200 of his colleagues. Um, Larry, as co-founder of, of Google, now CEO of Alphabet, what are you going to do with the, I think it was like $138 billion that they had abroad. I may get the net number wrong, but it was some ridiculous number in the many billions of dollars. What are you planning on doing with the money you have overseas when you bring it back? And most people would think he'd talk about artificial intelligence, um, um, internet of things, supply chain, um, uh, internet coverage in, in, in rural areas. There could be many different things. His answer was traffic lights. I want to solve the traffic light problem. 
And I said this to Jeff after, and he said, you know, Jeff says, yeah, you, you got almost word for word what he said. He said, I sit in my office in Mountain View and I look out and there's people who come into my office could be working. They're sitting in traffic light, not moving. And um, then he uh, says that I want him to come to work. And then twice in the next 10 minutes, Jeff asked him other questions. And every time his answer, even had nothing to do with traffic lights, it was traffic lights. He wants to solve the traffic light problem. And so the, the reason why I tell that story is because he wasn't talking about traffic lights. He was thinking eight steps ahead. And what he was thinking about was if we have autonomous interconnected vehicles, the vehicles will go past each other. We wouldn't need traffic lights. Some people claim we have too many roads in the United States. Not that we have not enough roads. And the reason why is that we actually just use our roads really inefficiently. And so he is someone who's able to think three, four, five steps ahead. And to illustrate how they use it and why strategic, strategic control is so important, it's another Google story, but I was at another summit, it's Latin American uh, CEO summit in Miami. And I was talking about the kinds of things we're talking about now. And right before lunch, and this is the way, by the way, I start off the, the book, The Carrot and the Stick, um, but there's a CEO of one of the largest insurance companies in Latin America comes up to me uh, bef right, right before break, you know, before we go to lunch, and says, um, I hate Google. And I said, well, that's rather strong. Why do you hate Google? And, and he says, he says, because they're extorting money out of me. And I said, well, tell me more. And he says, he says, well, in my insurance business, they know that driver A drives too fast, that they drive on average about 20, 10 to 20% over the speed limit. They know driver B travels too closely to the car in front of them. They know driver C never stops at stop signs. And driver D is really good, obeys all traffic laws and stays within the speed limit. And they know that because over 95% of the phones in, in my home country either have the Android operating system or uses Google Maps slash Waze, owned by Alphabet, in my home country. So they can track our users. And they want to cut of that. They want to sell me that driver information, tell me who drives well, who doesn't. And so I have to pay up. And worse yet, if I don't pay up, they threaten to sell that information to my rival. <laughs> and so I don't have a choice because then I'm going to be at a disadvantage. And then he goes on to say they know that and they're using it for profit. Now think about it. They don't have, they're not in the insurance business. They're in the operating system, mobile phone, information business. But because they have that information, that point of strategic control, and because they got penetration, 85% of world phones use, use the Android operating system. Google Maps has a huge penetration. Um, because they have that information, they're able to get margins from insurance, from other businesses, because they have that location. That's what we look for. How do I get information, even not in my core business, because I own a point of strategic control? Anyway, I've gone on for a while about Alphabet, but it started because they really understand it. And it starts with the founders of the company. And that's absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. Like, honestly, this is such a mind-blowing thing that I feel like a, a lot of entrepreneurs, they go in the business and they spend, you know, two, five, 10 years struggling and if they, if everybody knew this from the jump, from day one, yeah. I feel like there would be so many powerful entrepreneurs. We would be so far, uh, so much more far ahead of where we are today in regards to innovation. And it's just, it's, it's just truly fascinating the, the work that you've, you've done here. Mm -hmm. So, so Joe, so I, I couldn't, agree, I couldn't agree more about entrepreneurs. And I often say, you know, so I have a, good friend of mine who asked a question, it seems like when you read the book, it's almost a recipe for how to monopolize an industry. And in many ways you think about it, it's, it's, it, is, it is the playbook that Amazon used, that Alibaba used in China. It's the playbook that Alphabet used essentially to build their empire. And if I'm a small entrepreneur and I wanna fight back against that, without knowing that, how do you fight back against those large companies? How do you build the business like they did without knowing that? How do you, have informed antitrust policy addressing what they've done with that power until you know what the source of the power is. And so I, you know, if you're a small entrepreneur, uh, and, and uh, you know, you often say, well, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And I think about where I invest my money. If somebody, somebody comes to me as they do with an entrepreneurial idea, I actually will 
not telling them, of course, but I sketch out my own value chain. And I think about where the points of strategic control and what do they have. If someone else has a unique capabilities in the in capability in that market and they don't have access to it, I don't care how good your idea is, I don't care how good your, your business plan is, I don't care how big of a market is, someone else is gonna suck all the margin in it. So choice of market is so important. And you know, I, I, I think about, you know, people often do market assessments, so I tell companies I work with when, when, I, when I do a lot of stuff on the strategy side, is people look at markets, I go into markets, presumably there's not a lot of competitors, I find t markets that may be more attractive, that's big and growing, uh, but, but if I go into those markets that look really good on face value, but someone else owns a point of strategic control and they're smart, that company, that person, that entity is going to let you in the market, but you're going to suck all your margin. You're going to charge you a lot for that thing that's in short supply. So yeah. you don't have a lot of your margins. And so it doesn't make sense to go into it anyway. So entrepreneurs more than anyone, I would argue, need to think about markets this way. Yeah. So it's that's a stupid, stupid question. Yeah. So that that even solves like the first question of like if somebody does want to become an entrepreneur or a business owner, like what they should go in. Because I see a lot of people on social media, they've been trying to figure out, oh, I want to start a business, but I don't really know what I want to do. So like even like thinking about this concept can help them determine where they should even go. So that's a great question again, and I, I couldn't agree more. And so the way I would think about it, the way I'd frame it, and so I have, a, I have a first book called Compete Smarter, Not Harder, and it's all about choosing this kind of duality of markets. The way I'd frame it, think about it this way, if I'm a small entrepreneur, uh, is to me the magic and strategy that happens, whether it be a small business or a large business, is when two things meet. And Elon Musk, I'll, I'll illustrate with an example, Elon Musk and what he did with solar as a classic example. But when I find a group of customers, call it, we, I would work it through and call it a segment, that are really, um, really attractive. They are willing to pay a lot. They're um, large in size. Whatever criteria that would make a group of customers really attractive. And they have a need for something, whatever it is. Set that aside. That's one part of it. And then if I go work through a value chain, and I'm able to find a part of that value chain that has a unique strategic control point, and I have a unique competency, and that competency enables me to give that one thing that that large attractive segment needs. I'm the only one who could do it because I own that point of strategic control and I can supply it to a customer segment that really needs it. That's where strategy happens. That's where good companies really succeed. And if you think about it logically, they need something. I'm the only one that can provide it and I can meet a need. So the customer wins because I'm giving them something that they need, but I'm also able to get really good margins because I'm the only one to do it by what I identify in the value chain. So what happens with identifying customer need with what's going on in the value chain, those two pieces are where the magic happens. And um, the example I'll hold up is um, Elon Musk. And this may not work in, in the long run because of strategy execution issues, but Elon Musk and what he's done in solar. So I actually sometimes read a quote from him in sessions that I do with, with companies. Um, but we did a little bit of background. I did a, a very detailed value chain exercise um, for Owens Corning a number of years ago. They had a solar business. And um, Owens Corning located in Toledo, Ohio, um, run at the time by uh, Mike Thayman, a great business exec who really understands his markets. Um, but we were doing it for the solar business. And... Um, what we found in the solar business, because uh, they had a panel, some of you may know these, uh, some of the listeners out there, or you may know, um, Elon Musk has a business now, that's solar, that looks like real roofs. They look like slate tile, um, some Tuscan style ceramic, um, uh, really beautiful roofs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. also solar. And Owens Corning had a similar product that they were thinking about introducing in the market um, back, I think it was about six, maybe five, six years ago. And when we did this exercise, what we found when we did it years ago was that there was one company that owned about 40% of the installers for this new technology. The problem with this new technology is that installing it requires the installation by a licensed electrician. Old solar panels, a roofer would install them, and then you'd bring in a last day, a licensed electrician to hook it up. So you need maybe a day's of electrician time. And I don't know about, about, about you two, but... Um, we haven't recently hired an electrician. I, I should never got my PhD. I should have become an electrician. They make so much money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, so you'd have to hire someone to get up on the roof who's a licensed electrician to install these new panels. It's rather complicated. 
Turns out there was one company that owned about 40% of the installers that had the capability to do these that both had the licensed electrician and the ability to install on a roof. And that company was named Solar City. And Owens Corny thought about buying them. It was a very high debt laden, laden company. And they decided to not to buy the company and probably may not have been a bad decision. Elon Musk bought Solar City a couple of years ago. So think about it. They have the technology. The need of customers now are to have beautiful looking roofs that also keep us off the electric grid. Um, we don't need a buyer, you know, electric from PG&E or Duke Power or whomever. We can get it from our roofs, from the sun. Yeah. And Elon Musk is the one via his, his solar venture, the only one that can provide that in scale because he now owns almost 50% of the installer base that have the capabilities to do it. And he talks about how they position their roofs. If you think about it, he says, why would anyone want anything else when we can deliver beautiful roof that lasts longer than your existing roofs, costs less, and by the way, um, takes you off the grid to supply your electricity, why would anyone buy anyone else? The need is electricity, beautiful roof, solar, the unique capability from the value chain is the ability to install it. He's the only one can, that can meet those needs that's where magic happens. And that's what we look for in a business. That's amazing. That is. Another question I wanted to ask you, however, is you've worked with gargantuan companies, like very, very massive companies. And I feel like not very many people have the privilege of being able to say that. As a entrepreneur, how do you get into contact with these massive clients and how do you sell them on the idea of the carrot and stick approach? Because I feel like the hardest thing is getting in the door. I feel like once a CEO hears it, it's kind of like, oh yeah, we pay them. <laughs> but uh, how do you really get in the door with these, uh, this idea that you have that's so brilliant? So I, I've been I've been really fortunate in that I've been associated with some good universities and usually that's the way I start to get to know these companies early on in my career these days for me personally um, but then I'll answer your question about a budding entrepreneur for me personally it's all word of mouth I don't do any marketing of anything um, people contact me because fun, I just had someone um, last week who I may do some work with um, really interesting company that uh, makes uh, motors for electric planes. Um, the idea of taking, making a plane, brilliant business, uh, planes um, so that they um, uh, have zero carbon footprint and um, really good company doing some really interesting technology. Hopefully we'll do some work with them. Um, that remains to be seen. But it was someone I worked with when um, they were at, 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 at the Boeing company. Um, companies that I've done this are smaller companies, you know, $3 million in sales, not a small company, but small compared to a Boeing um, are companies um, like um, at core, which is located in Harvey, Illinois, which makes racetracks or um, Globe Union, um, just outside of Chicago, smaller companies like that. All those companies were brought to me because I had worked with someone who was with, on case I was corning, then he moved to at core. So that kind of word of mouth. So that doesn't help answer your question for anyone else out there. Um, I often argue it's we, the way you, if I were, a listener and I wanted to start a business, first I'd look to the carrot and stick to try and understand how I can use that and create a value chain and start small. I work for, I mean, we work for local businesses who may have $70,000 in revenue to apply this. My son um, started a not-profit a num number of years ago. He's since kind of moved away from it and not anymore just because he's now um, finishing up college but that help local businesses applying these techniques to, to, to small little mom and pops. But to a local entrepreneur, I'd say find the, the, the carrot and the stick, understand the approach and go to a smaller company. It doesn't have to be a Boeing. Um, it, it could be a, 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 you know, you're probably not gonna get in the door right away even to an at core at, you know, 3 million in annual sales, but you can do it for a, a, a distributor of a, a good friend who's sort of built a business, um, Dirk Beveridge, who runs a conference every year in Chicago, a really good one, by the way, you guys should go. Uh, it's called Unleashed WD. You're right there. It's a great conference, great way to network. Um, and go to a conference like Unleashed WD, where there are small distributors from out the country. And as you talk to them, they may say, hey, come in and do a free day. And I, my, 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 I'm open source. Um, so if, if you take a look at the book and I go step by step, there isn't a person out there who couldn't take the book and then take what I do in the book and use it to build their own consulting business. 
um, go to one of those and say, hey, I'll give you a free um, half a day. I'm going to talk to you how you would do it for your business. Start to do the analysis, get your foot in the door. And once they see in an hour or two with their people what you have to offer based on the carrot and the stick, um, I'd, I'd argue that most businesses would come and bring them back for more. Uh, so to me, that's the way you get in. You never, you'd never get in the door to, uh, you know, to work for a, for an Owens Corning or a, a Boeing or a John Deere straight away, but going and, and eventually if you start, especially if you're, you know, you, you both are, are young, you both as an example could take this and then build a business as the execs who you work for in those smallish companies, move up the ladder to larger companies that that network builds and then they bring you in. And I would argue that's probably the best way way to do it. It's worked for me in, in a different sense, but it could work for any budding entrepreneur out there too. And then the other thing with entrepreneurs, I'd argue, if you have a business idea, the biggest problem, and I'm working, been working with a company up in Toronto on a lighting business they have, and the, 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 the CEO and founder of the company is absolutely brilliant. He's a mad scientist genius. The problem is, is the fundamentals of business um, are not always there. So yes, what's, what's good about, what's better about your product, what's different? Well, different doesn't mean it's better. As Roger Martin up in Toronto, the University of Toronto always used to say, and I love the way he framed it, he said, Differenti different doesn't mean differentiated. Different is just different. Differentiated is different in a way that adds value to customers for which they pay some and of which we can extract some. And so that's really what we're trying to do here. And so if you, if you apply that, that, that basic framework to any business, I think um, it's, it's fairly straightforward. And I think you know, any smart person out there can use it in entrepreneurship uh, setting as well. Absolutely. Wow. This episode has been like mind blowing for us. So I could, I just know that it's going to be mind blowing for our listeners too. So what is the number one takeaway that you'd want someone to walk away from this episode with? I love it. Great, great question, Jess. So I, I, I'd argue that anything you do in business, any idea, any uh, venture is you need to think carefully about more than anything, finding a point of strategic control in that business. If you can't find one, run. That's the short version. The longer version by, and I won't take long, but I'll, I'll give it as a, a, a private equity company that I've worked with and one of the guys um, who since moved to a different private equity shop, um, Terry Theodore, who I quote in the book, um, used to say that if we find a business that has a point of strategic control, we're very aggressive in, in trying to acquire that business. If we um, can't find a point of strategic control, we run from the deal. You should do the same thing if you have a business idea. There's no point of strategic control and you really don't have a lot to offer other than differentiated products. Someone's going to imitate you. Yeah. If you go to Shark Tank and listen to their, you know, they always ask the question, what's proprietary to the business? Why can't someone, Kevin O'Leary comes in and says, oh, why don't I just get $200 million and do the same thing and squash you, is what he says. And uh, although you don't like to think that way, you got to be careful as an entrepreneur. You don't want that to happen. Yeah. yeah. That would be the number one takeaway. And, and that's brilliant because honestly, it, it can happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it definitely can happen. Yeah. So you're on the Abundant Culture podcast. So we feel the need to ask everybody this question that comes on because we always get very, very unique questions. And the question is, whether it be in your business or your personal life, how do you like to spread abundance to the people around you? So I, I always love this. I think at, at a time right now when we're going through what we're going through, um, I think spending more time worrying about others than yourself. And so I'll, I'll throw out an example here. Um, I've done probably, I don't know, eight or 10 webinars, um, electric distribute, electrical distributors, um, something I put up on my website, putsus.com, on what small businesses can do today to learn lessons from the past. We have, we know very specifically what companies in previous recessions have done, our previous downturns, whether temporary or longer, longer lasting, have done to weather the storm and get out of this and do well and thrive. And so I put a um, number of postings up there advising based on what I've learned in business, um, advising them on how they can survive through this. I believe in small business. 
Um, we can learn from the big businesses what small businesses can do. So the, 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 the short answer is finding a way to help businesses that may struggle generally, but, but in particular the struggling today get through that time is to me, at least my way, not direct answer to your question, but my way of giving back to um, those that need it most. And so, like I said, that video, um, and I'm not promoting myself, I'm really trying to post it so that you can learn as a small business if you're struggling now, what you need to do to try and weather the current storm. And so that video is up in putsus.com. It's on the front page. Literally, it's just a click and, and watch. But we have so much we've learned from previous recessions that I hope every business out there heeds the advice um, and weathers the storm, stays healthy. Um, not a direct answer to your question, but to me, that's that's the thing that I believe in doing most, especially right now. Yeah, honestly, it was perfect. It was a yeah. perfect answer to the question. Um, and I truly appreciate that. I'm definitely going to watch that video yep. as well myself. <laughs> uh, so uh, you've given us so much knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, such a wealth of knowledge during this uh, about an hour. And I always know it's a really good podcast when I don't have to ask that many questions. So you made <laughs> it very easy on us. I appreciate that. But um, I'm pretty sure there's some uh, companies out there, certain entrepreneurs out there who uh, love to somehow work with you, uh, get your book and uh, maybe interview you for whatever reason, how does somebody actually get into contact with either you or your team? That's, that's nice of you to ask, thank you. Um, the easiest is putsis.com. Um, P-U-T-S-I-S is my last name, um, dot com. There's contact information on there, there's a blog, there's um, and in the news page and all of that. Um, the email that is also on there, but there are various, uh, you know, it's william.putsis at yale.edu is probably the easiest. So Yale as in the university and william.putsis, my name. The book, there are two of them um, that I have. The most recent is The Carrot and the Stick. The earlier, as I mentioned before, is Compete Smarter, Not Harder. They're just, if you Google my name on Amazon, again, with a name like Putsis, I'm the only one that will show up. Um, <laughs> And both books will be on Amazon, on Kindle, on, um, and we're, we're working on the audio books, not up just yet, but it will be. Um, that's wow. probably the easiest way. Thanks, Joe, for asking. That's excellent. Well, this episode was so, so great, and we truly appreciate all the knowledge you gave, not only our listeners, but us as well, because this was just, like, awesome. <laughs> so well, thank you. Both been, you. You both have been great hosts, um, and I appreciate um uh, you letting me uh, talk with you this 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 morning, and I, I've enjoyed it more than you have. I've the conversation's been great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll stay in touch for sure. So that's all we have for today, folks. I hope you got as much value out of this as we did. Keep in mind, the only way we can improve is through constructive feedback. So remember to rate and review this episode. Also, you are not the only person that needs to know this super valuable information. So be sure to subscribe and share as well. Stay tuned for the next episode. And remember to always spread abundance. Peace.